We are the generation of transformation. Your ancestors could not find the holy inside of their own bodies and live it in their lifetime. So that becomes your responsibility. You are here so you can fully embody your erotic aliveness, your erotic sovereignty, so that you can hold the high priestess and the queen in you so that you can elevate everyone. We get to be the mirror from which he finds his king through our own connection to our own divinity. You can find the life force all in your own body, in your own heart, in your own mind, body, spirit. And if you bring that life force forward, that's actually what's fighting the war consciousness. It's life. It's life versus anti-life. And so we got to be able to find that. I am connected to my erotic divinity, and I will practice and play this instrument in service to that which is greater. The whole cosmos is built on allurement and attraction. Even the way the molecules come together and the moon pulls the tides, everything is connected by this erotic field. Most women come from such an extreme extraordinary deficit in terms of erotic aliveness or erotic fulfillment. Regina, here oh, we are. Here we are. Here we are. There's so much going on in the world right now, and sometimes it feels like people feel bad for being in their pleasure right now. They feel bad for finding that spark of light and eros and love and laughter within themselves because, you know, people are suffering. Dude, I'm like a Jewish mother. Like, and as a Jewish mother, it's not just like the suffering of my kid or the happiness of my kid. It's not just the suffering of the Israeli people, the Palestinian people the Ukrainian, the Russian, the Afghanistan, the, it's like oh, just holding it all. All of it. All of it. And then, you know, literally, I was like, how the fuck can we go, like, Peter, I was like, Peter, how can we go to Arcadia when the world is burning? Because all I want to do, who else has this, like, where you just want to crawl into a fetal position and hold yourself and rock and, and just, and, 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 and feel numb and immobilized is what happens to me and my body, which is the worst possible feeling because we want to be able to be people taking relevant action and the last possible place that any of us have been taught to look is in the direction of our own radiance, our own aliveness, our own erotic sovereignty. Like that's the last place. And that's, and, and it's the only place. Mm. It's the only place from which we can actually rebuild the world or re-envision the world, but you don't want to go there because there's so much suffering that how could you break through that wall with a step in the direction of your pleasure? It's, it's like um, Audre Lorde says, a feminist writer, she says, you cannot dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. And all we want to do is reach for those fucking hammers yeah. and start hammering oh, each other. Oh, there's a war? Let me go to yeah. war. Yeah. War will fix war. Yeah. More war yeah. will fix more war. And then yeah. more war, the most war will fix the most war. And yeah. it, that's not the way. Actually, if you look at the forces, like there's this force of death, a force of death, anti-life. Let's just call it anti-life, an anti-life force. Well, what's the life force? Well, you can find the life force all in your own body, in your own heart, in your own mind, body, spirit. And if you bring that life force forward, that's actually what's fighting the war consciousness. It's life. It's life versus anti-life. Mm -hmm. And so we got to be able to find that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like almost, uh, you know, in, in a culture that uh, disconnects and disempowers all of us from our pleasure and from our eroticism based on all of the patriarchal world's culture and the 
religions that w- that have dominated, right? So we all f- the the direction that like the antidote is moving in a direction which like blasts our ego apart because you you feel so wrong for doing the very thing that will elevate the conscious not just of each of us but of the world. And so like, how do you bust through that? How does your discipline and your practice of pleasure become so profound that no matter what is happening out there, you're willing to say, I am hot. I am majestic. I am connected to my erotic divinity and I will practice and play this instrument in service to that which is greater. And I will not agree with whatever the culture is trying to, you know, put a chokehold yeah. on our pleasure and our experience of pleasure. So it, it, it ain't easy now, baby. No, it ain't easy. It, it ain't, ain't easy, easy, but I just want to say, motherfuckers, you're all here. Yeah. You're we all in fucking here. here. And that, that I, I, I know the children you had to leave, the loved ones, the dogs you had to get dog sitters for. I know, like, m- m- packing that suitcase, putting in those costumes, like that, it is not easy to throw a party when the world is having a big death march. But you did it. You did it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. These are your people. Well, you know, one of the things that Mark Gaffney says is that every failure of ethics is a failure of eros. Right? So that eros and okay, wait ethics a minute, wait a are linked. Minute. Hold on. We need to breathe that in, right? Every failure of ethics is a failure of eros. eros. Okay. So hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, failure of what does he mean by so, failure so of eros? This is what this is what he means. What he means is is if you're in your erotic body, yeah. If you're fully enlivened, yeah. fully enlivened, where you merge with the divine source field of eros itself, with Shekinah herself. If you merge with the goddess eros, if you're in uh-huh. eros the goodness will actually flow through your body. So all of those people who commit any version of atrocities or violence or other things, they're clearly not in their erotic body. If they were able to look at a grape and taste the sweetness of it, what hateful comment would they want to spread in that Mm -hmm. moment? None. Mm -hmm. If they were fucked into the divine rapture of God, do they really want to change someone's beliefs on the other side of some line somewhere? Do they really? No, they don't. But the problem is, as you said, these structures, they've placed blockages in our channel to access Eros. And these blockages create create contorted, twisted, like kinks in the hose so that our people's Eros doesn't Who are you flow. calling a hoe? <laughs> Okay, so maybe I'm a hoe. No. But I'll call you a kink. <laughs> I just had this vision while you were saying this, you know, because I was like picturing like biblical, you know, we bring up Gaffney and I was like in the Bible for a minute and then I was in Israel and then I was, and then I was watching you in my imagination and I was seeing all of you, the women here who are, of course, high priestesses of sexuality. Yeah. Clearly. And you were marching them to the front lines and you were saying, here are my maidens. We are here to fuck the war out of the soldiers. Yeah. Not a bad. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> it's not Re- a bad plan. Regina for peace negotiations. A hundred percent. I just want to know, like... And for the ladies, we got Kyle Kingsbury and his speedo <laughs> coming on down. So Ready to serve. Who's down? Fit for who's service. Down. Okay, we got, like, a lot of willing high priestesses here, and I think tonight we could get a sign-up sheet, and we could get, like, a few thousand. We could charter a plane, and I think we could make an impact. Fuck the war out of the world. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Fuck, fuck the war out of the world.
Yeah. With uh, Aubrey uh, Marcus. <laughs> 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 but back to your point, you know, it's like people do a lot of really shitty things in the name of love, right? And uh and and that's why I think pleasure is actually the highest level of morality. Agreed. Because you if you knew that there was something you were doing that would di- you know, be hurtful or harmful to another, and you were tuned in and tapped into your own pleasure, you could never do it. But, you know, you could beat your child if you love your child. Like, I am beating you because you're naughty and you need to learn. Like, you know, we do a lot of shitty things in the name of love. But that's the name of love, which we call love, but Mm -hmm. is it really love? That's the question, right? Like so many things in the name of love, but it's not usually love. It's usually some identity attachment complex or some way in which you don't feel whole unless your partner reflects that wholeness upon you. It's the neediness of that moment. It's the insecurity of that moment. And then we just whitewash it with love because these things are attached to love, but they aren't love. Nobody does something bad actually in love in love in the field of love but they think they do they think they do and that's where that's where the words get confusing right that's where people are misperceiving it and they start to isolate it and make it a personal love or personal pleasure like my pleasure matters but your pleasure doesn't matter but pleasure is a field Love mm-hmm. is a field. And when you're really in pleasure or you're in love, you're in love in accord with the field. Mm-hmm. Everything else is like a pseudo pleasure. It's mm-hmm. like the packaged pharmaceutical version of this is a little mm-hmm. dose of pleasure for you for now mm-hmm. at the cost of your future self or at the cost of somebody else. Mm-hmm. But the real love, the real eros, the real pleasure, it's always connected to that larger field because yeah. we have to be able to feel each other. We have these mirror neurons that fire. We have yeah. compassion and compersion yeah, and all yeah, of these yeah, things, yeah. the shared mutuality of yeah. eros. I mean, yeah. when you're sitting with your priestesses and you're going through a pleasure practice, the f- whole field of, I haven't been there. I don't have a yoni. So pussy, I don't have a pussy. Don't you really? I mean, don't you really? Cause like I have a cock. Yeah. No, I haven't found mine then. I don't know. I can feel yours. <laughs> I can feel yours. Well, do you want to do you want to describe my pussy to me? Yeah. Yeah. I do. I do. I do. I do. Okay. Yours is the kind of pussy. <laughs> she has this kind of regal Quiet confidence. Yeah, I see you just cross your legs the other way. <laughs> He's, she's feeling it, right? Uh, you know, which is like, oh no, you come to me. <laughs> Can you feel that? And it's such a sweet, like a little, almost like a little boy energy around his pussy. Like, uh, <laughs> Like it's just glistening and waiting to be noticed. <laughs> my my pussy is more of a showgirl. She's like, her name is Lola. See? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello world. I think I'll write a book about you and become a New York Times bestseller. Okay. No, no, just a, Yeah. Okay. That's you make an interesting point though, because pussy cock, these are actually representative of natures that are endemic to every single human being. Exactly. Like my willingness to yeah. receive and to yeah. receive whether that's information or a transmission or whatever it is, to like really receive that in. Well, that comes in through my metaphysical pussy. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and as I push out ideas and mm-hmm. thoughts and other things mm-hmm. into the world, that's my mm-hmm. metaphysical cock. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we all have a metaphysical pussy and cock. Oh, yeah, right on. And I actually, I mean, my cock is, it's weird. 
didn't know I was going to be talking Let about me, my should cock. I just try, should I describe your just, cock? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just so we're just so we're fair. <laughs> Let me get comfortable. I was going to describe your cock. I'm ready. Your cock is the kind of cock that knows that it's it's packing. (laughs) I mean, it's packing. It's thick. It's strong. (laughs) It gets hard and stays hard for as long as you want it to. (laughs) But you're so sure about your cock that you don't need to flex it. You don't need to walk around swinging, dingling in that thing. (laughs) You just know that you got it right there. Mm. And in the right moment, when that moment opens her glistening legs and the tumescent lips of something you can penetrate, that cock will engorge and the ecstasy will rise into a climax, and you just know that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how many of my ladies, are, are, are you in touch with your cocks? Yeah, right on. And sometimes do they get in your way? Right? You know, because we forget to unhook them when we're with our guys. And then it's like we're hitting... <laughs> <laughs> it can get nasty, yeah. I, I have, it's been maybe a, a lesson of my life. First of all, I think the first lesson was to learn how to activate that part of me to, uh, you know, because I started as like a little hippie chick that really, I just had a dream of um, turning women on so that I could turn the world on. But I, I just didn't care if I did it in my living room forever. I was just so happy to teach women about pussy and turn on and things like that. And then when shit got real and I was raising my kid, et cetera, I had to like find my big cock so I could like do spreadsheets and hire instead of just anyone who showed up at my door and said, hi, I love your book. Can I work with you? And I'd be like, uh-huh. That was more, let's say, feminine. And then I had to become more discerning and to be able to say, no, can you actually do anything? (laughs) Because you have a resume, you know, or something like that. Like, And then as I was raising my kid myself and running the company and wanting to create the pleasure revolution, creating the pleasure revolution, like my cock just got so big. And does anybody ever have that? Like your cock just grows like out of control. And and it's like almost like you, well, you know, how can you be penetrated? I, I'm sure you've met women like that, like where you can't penetrate because we've all been taught in this culture to man up. And so I think it's you want to be able to have that fluidity. At least I hope that I am better. You'll talk to Peter later and say. Does that crack ever get in the way in that bed? Is there too many cock? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, one, just to comment on that, what I have seen though is women who have that have a big cock. You know, have that really strong kind of masculine penetrative inclination. I recently met, and this is actually the podcast now. I'm recording now here at Arcadia, but it's it was released yesterday. And it was with Gabby Reese and Laird Hamilton. And Gabby Reese is a fucking badass. She's as tall as I am, just pro beach volleyball player, model, entrepreneur, just a badass mother. And she found someone in Laird Hamilton who is such a just a man, a good man in every sense of the world. And, and he... You know, he's obviously the greatest big wave surfer of all time. So strap himself into some, you know, into a surfboard that he can't get his feet out of, that if he gets caught underneath the wave, he'll be stuck under there and just have to just relax so he doesn't die like he told that story. And it's not only that he's willing to confront that wild feminine of the ocean, because the ocean is a woman, you know, and it's God to him. It's this is where he finds God and just 
be able to listen to her, to trust her, to know her, and to go on the biggest fucking ride that she can ever create, whatever the biggest wave in the world is, he's like, yeah, mama, give it that to me. That's what I want. And so she just melts and relaxes in the presence of that type of man. So it's not that any woman here who has that really strong, you know, kind of masculine inclination, there's still another type of man that you'll be able to go like, oh, wow, I can let my cock go limp and I can let this man fuck me with the entirety of his essence because I can like let all that go. And is it, would you say you, did you want to cheer? Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) Great. Um, do you have that relationship with your inner pussy yet? Like, are there times when you can feel into that side of you? And, and I'm, I'm curious about this because I, I flipping through my Instagram the other day and there was Meryl Streep was on and she was like, Hey, was, she's speaking with a bunch of wonderful, highly evolved men. And she was saying, guys, women have learned to speak man our whole lives. We're fluent. We dream in man or masculine, but men don't speak woman. And so I just was wondering if you can relate to that or do you like, do you, how is your woman, how is How's your pussy? How's your pussy? <laughs> yeah. You know, when I, I've actually gotten definitely more and more in touch with that aspect of myself because I trust, I think for a man, you have to trust your virility. Like mm-hmm. you have to trust that you're a man, right. trust that you're a king, right. trust that you, right. and when you trust that so deep, you don't have to push it in front of you. Mm-hmm. You don't have to carry it forward. So whether it's just kind of, you know, with like my sister, Waira, like I'll see her and I'll nuzzle up against her. And I'll just let her like, you know, it, it's just, there's a certain softness of just purely receiving. And even, even when we hug, you know, it's just like, I'll just nuzzle on in there. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to mm-hmm. penetrate with the hug. Right. I'm just trying to like feel in and, and feel that. And so it's this dropping of all of that to be able to really receive. Mm -hmm. And it's so, you know, delicious and restorative when I'm able to do that. And I'm very comfortable in that kind of Mm -hmm. role now. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Cause I think it's, yeah, yeah. Give him the snack. Let's have a snack. Um, Because I, I think receiving is difficult for women also, you know, for us to receive attention, don't you think, compliments, uh, we are not necessarily at first feeling worthy of receiving. And so it's wonderful that that is a part of you that's starting to get more robust and, and, and more cultivated. Yeah. And it's, it's also trusting that people actually, you know, good people, the right people, our people, they want to give. Mm -hmm. They want to give. Now, I remember I've always been a a generous lover. I love to give. I love to give pleasure. And I love, you know, my own erotic desires and Mm -hmm. fantasies to be met. Like, what's your favorite thing to give? (laughs) Just curious. I mean, er erotically speaking. Yes. My favorite thing to give is my own rapture uh, in yes. every smell, every mm-hmm. texture, every like I'll I'll spend time and I'll, I'll like I'll sniff the armpits mm-hmm. and the and the lips and breathe when I kiss yeah. I'll breathe the breath. Yeah. And then I'll move down of course to the pussy and just take a moment to just smell her and be with her and like, like feel her coming alive and then to offer my own gift of pleasure to that. I mean, that's actually probably one of my favorite 
moments of sexing. It's just that moment where I get to greet the pussy. Yeah. And and the whole woman and just say like, no, I love all of it. Hairy, not hairy with all of your odors and all of your things. Like I want my lover and my wife now especially to just know like I fucking love all of mm-hmm. it. You know, like I love how you smell. I love mm-hmm. how you taste. I mm-hmm. love every sound that you make. Mm-hmm. I love the breath that fills mm-hmm. my own lungs from mm-hmm. your lungs. Like mm-hmm. To just know that I I love the whole essence and want to pour my own desire and into that essence mm-hmm. and wake it up and alive in it and watch it like that, you know, that desert flower that blooms when you sprinkle the moisture, mm-hmm. the feminine moisture, mm-hmm. and it just blooms mm-hmm. open. The, the Rose of Jerusalem rose, what is it? Rose of Jericho, what is that? Rose of Jericho, that you just sprinkle a little water on this little this little acorn and it just blossoms mm. right up. And... Come on, you have to snap for that. Uh, yeah. Okay, that was really good for me. Thank you. <laughs> I don't need anything else today. <laughs> just filled up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's your favorite what's your favorite part about like engaging with a man's cock? Uh, mm. You know how you were talking before about the field. Mm-hmm. So there's a roomy poem. And a line from that Rumi poem is out beyond wrongdoing and right doing. There is a field. I'll meet you there. And then the poem goes on. And I always think of that as I approach my lover, Peter. Well, my fiance, Peter. Two weeks tomorrow, we're engaged. <laughs> um, okay, I revere cock. I'm salivating right now. Just saying the word cock. So oh, Kyle. Oh, Kyle, so, Kyle is so excited. <laughs> uh, just like the fragrant. Well, okay, f- first of all, I, I would I would never no, sometimes I just start with his cock. That is that's true. Or just like the area around his cock, like that a man's chest, that little trail of belly hair that kind of surrounds the pubic hair. I just love to breathe in, inhale. That just yeah. exactly the way you were describing, like the scent of his skin. I love it if he's a little sweaty. Just like his essence, I love. I, I, you know, here's the crazy thing. I'm learning more about cock with Peter than I ever knew because you know when you're in a partnership, um, you're you're with this one body. I I was a floater previously, and so I didn't have like. <laughs> You know, I would be more, I would be less focused on one guy. Oh, when you put that thing there, Aubrey, you know what I mean? (laughs) Um, So what I've had this experience with him of, um, you know, I'm so delighted like to take his cock in my hands, in my mouth, to feel it grow, to... Uh, you know, just like be so pleasured by the sensation of that delicious soft skin and that hard cock, that combination is so irresistible. And I just like want to feel that in every one of my orifices and it's so good and so good. And, but here's the thing I've learned with Peter, like his cock does not have to be hard to turn me on or to actually activate my entire body. Like I have fucked Peter. Are we allowed to talk about this on your podcast? Yeah. Okay, okay. I, like, I mean, look behind us. We got a giant fine. dog with a right, thousand titties. Dog. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I fucked Peter with his cock soft, and like it, 
it was like literally shattering energy in my whole body that shocked the shit out of me because I have such a cultural prejudice as do many of us thinking that as in pornography, that the only effective experience of sex or sensuality is with a hard cock. But I have such a love affair with his soft cock. Like it's just like so, it's almost more filled with magic because it is not, doesn't have a goal. And I just want, I I, I don't know what to say except I am in love with every aspect of his masculinity from his softness to his half hardness to his rock hard, like all of it is delicious and mm, intoxicating. That's a, that's such a healing thing for men to hear. And I speak for myself because I carried so much shame about those moments when my cock wasn't hard enough, right? So much when I was younger in my teens right. and twenties, like so much shame. I felt like impotent, ineffective, yeah. like not a man. I would beat myself up. It was like, it was this constant battle. And I think so many men equate their actual manhood their own identity structure is built around the hardness of their car yeah. when really like actually when you understand that you can fuck with the entirety of your being and take that cock energy and put it through the entirety of who you are and vailana has been amazing in helping teach me this where i can like bring that bestial animalistic fuck energy through my body and regardless of which dimension my cock is in because in the fifth dimension above it's not hard it's like but whatever else wherever it is you know and i'm here in the third dimension and my cock's somewhere out in the stars doesn't matter no you know like i can really bring her into that state of eros and that's been so healing because there's no win-lose proposition in this game it's like no we're going to fuck no matter what yeah uh the yes whoop love the whoop and it's fun too because like there's somebody over here that is really whooping for the soft cock and (laughs) we have like down front is like the heart, you know. It's good. Anyway. Soft cock clan. <laughs> Hard cock clan. But, <laughs> over here. but the thing is, like, we women, we don't really like to tell them this, and I apologize in advance if I'm fucking things up for you, but we're, we're responsible for the hardness of your cock. Like, you cannot get your cock hard yourself. You can't. Like if I say to you, you know, raise your right hand in the air, Aubrey. You'd, yeah, you go. You're no problem with that. But I was like, get your cock hard, Aubrey. No. <laughs> no. no, no, but if, you know, Vailana was sitting here and she was turned on, like, bang, you know, whether you want it hard or not, that shit is going to rise. And so, and we as women, we don't always want hard cocks. And so we don't get them hard. And, but it's never his fault. It's like we do not have an interest at that particular moment. Maybe we don't want it hard because we would like him to, you know, do a sacred revival ritual on our entire body. Maybe we want to be, have somebody read poetry to us or nibble our neck or tell us a bedtime story. You know, there's other things that we long for, a massage. So it's like I am responsible for the cock beside me. And when I want it hard, so shall it be, <laughs> and not before. <laughs> yeah. Does that like does that track with you? It does to it does to a certain extent for sure. So it's a yes, yes, and there were periods where you know the lover that I was with was fully ready to receive me, but I was so stuck in my head, I was so afraid of failure of not pleasing the goddess like my one of my greatest fears is that ah, i won't please the goddess and that's obviously embodied by the goddess in front of me the lover in front of me but it also is relative to 
Gaia Sophia, the great goddess, the mother, like I'm a, all, that's probably my deepest rooted fear is that I'm going to not please the goddess yeah. in some way. And before, in my younger years, that fear and the shame that I would feel if I didn't do it, it would start to play these tricks on my yeah. mind and actually prevent me, even when the moment was right. And, you know, again, there's a lot of other moments where you don't really know that person enough. You kind of are turned on, but you think it's, but actually you really need to slow down. So absolutely, I totally agree that there's so many situations that apply like what you're saying. And sometimes for a man, actually the situation is right and ready, but there's some way that the mind or the small aspects of the mind, not the big M capital mind that knows that the whole cosmos is built on allurement and attraction and fuck and even the way the molecules come together and the moon pulls the tides everything is connected by this erotic field not that capital m mind but the small egoic mind that links your identity to your performance and if your performance doesn't meet what you think your performance should meet then your whole identity powers down to such a degree and it's such a painful and hurtful thing that the fear overwhelms you you know it's like if you're going to you know you, play, you should play. have just called me <laughs> i i needed your number back then i mean so <laughs> many so many men though needed to hear no. some different version hopefully you know still now you know even though this wisdom is, is percolating but like yeah. need to hear like no 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 it's okay yeah like there's there's so much more if you just let down all of those ideas and stories and get with someone who really is like a, like a sex priestess in some way. She can revive and heal all of those elements which will heal deep, deep parts of your own psyche and soul. So if you're out trying to penetrate the world with your idea and you become flaccid and it doesn't turn out whether it's in a sport or whether it's in your, your work life or a speech or whatever you're trying to do in that moment and you're not able... Like it's okay then too. You can still love yourself. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you're not a not and, a man. And that and that's really like uh, <laughs> that's really like the you know the difference between the masculine and the feminine, right? Because the, the masculine is really about doing accomplishment, uh, the goal, and the feminine is more like loving every single aspect, like loving the connection, loving the transparency, finding the holy and the sacred in, in the softness of the cock or the moment, like that there, there is no end game better than right now. And that's why it's such a beautiful dance, right? Because we get to bring that when our pussies are activated, which is like a whole other story, this whole other chapter, this whole other verse. When our pussies are activated and we can, we have that sense of, uh, you know, I am a fucking, I am, a, I am a, like a legendary example of feminine majesty. And I know that in every part of my being, then I have the surplus to love his heartbreak, to love his uh, fear, to love every you know facet of his unfolding sensuality and reflect back to him his majesty. Like we get to be the mirror from which he finds his king through our own connection to our own divinity and our own, you know, High Priestess, Queen, all those things. Yeah. yeah it's just I, what we do. I feel that. And, and yeah. you know, I, I really feel like there's so much healing that can happen. Yeah. First of all, there's the healing that can happen with you, with yourself. You know, there's a lot mm -hmm. that you can do with you, with yourself. But because sexing is an act that it really, well, it can involve yourself, but it involves your partner, your mm -hmm. lover. There's so much mutual healing that can go yes. both ways because it's not just men that have their own insecurities. You know, there's women who are worried about how they smell. Oh, I stink today. Oh, I don't, I don't know how my pussy smells. And it's like mm -hmm. you find a man that's like, give me that transatlantic flight middle seat pussy. <laughs> like, like, 
fresh <laughs> off the plane. Oh my god, you <laughs> you've been mile high how many times? <laughs> oh my god, like you be you on an airplane single? Oh shit. <laughs> Cannot even imagine the line stretching down the <laughs> <laughs> But that 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 thing that you get, you know, and yeah. whatever it is, you know, Vilana's hands and feet would sweat, and then she would get a little shy about that. But yeah. then, just like loving holding yeah. her hand, and it's not wasn't just me that did it. Yeah, she yeah. had another brother that was like, "I love your sweaty hands and feet," and mm. and like just to feel that she's loved in the entirety of her body, however yeah. it is. Yeah. I think that's the gift that a man can give a woman. And of Truly. course, all those gifts that you were talking about that a woman can give a man. And it's just a matter of like, can we level up ourselves and level each other up yeah. in this to really get this full erotic healing, which mm-hmm. is a full ethical healing yeah. as well. It's so big, Aubrey. Like, I think, you know, uh, based on whatever my family of origin, the abuse patterning in my family, all that kind of thing. Like if it wasn't for meeting Peter and letting his love in, I think I could have, I would have moved through this life without ever feeling completely and totally and absolutely loved to every cell of my being. And I feel just so grateful that I have that experience in my life because I could have missed it. You know, I could have missed it with whatever, whatever else I was doing to fill my days. <laughs> like, and I'm really grateful that I, that he happened to me, you know, like that I got to meet him and yeah. Peter Sweeney. You know, what it, what it makes me think about is like one of the things that we've lost is we've lost the erotic temple. We've lost the temple, the temple, you know, all of these, you know, desert religions in particular, but religions all over the place who, you know, say that spirit is good, body is bad. This, you know, Mm -hmm. all of these ideas that are universal, whether it's a monastic religion or whether it's just those shame filled, you know, Protestant Catholic religions or whatever that place shame at the center of our sex and the center of our eros, which is our connection to the greater field of eros, all of this you know, all of those, and that energy you could collectively call empire, that anti-life, anti-eros energy has shut down all of the temples and all of the access. So the ability, like we used to have the ability to not rely on our other, you know, as we're growing up, like our teenage friend, is she going to be the embodied? Well, maybe, but not in this culture at the very least, but probably not even then they're young, people are young, but there was the temple. You could go to the temple and find somebody there who actually could bring you into that state, whether you were having actual sex or not, but to like help show you those things. Mm -hmm. And it just feels like, yes, we can find that with each other if we're lucky and if we're open and if we're tuned in and Mm -hmm. if we give that synchronicity machine, if we give the mystery a chance to weave us with the right person and we get in the right state. But also like the bringing these temples back, and I know the logistics and legal aspect and all, it's all not culturally appropriate to do it but i also just feel the need for that to return Mm -hmm. a place where someone's like fuck like i live in a small town in iowa like and i'm listening to this podcast and where the fuck am i gonna go to find this embodied priestess but if there was a you know a temple somewhere and fucking i don't know in the sierras or wherever you want to put it around the beach somewhere and Mm -hmm. you could go into the temple and in that temple in a three-day experience with maybe some psychedelic wine and these priestesses and you go there and they come back and all of a sudden they're that type of man or conversely like a woman can go someplace and they're that type of woman and then things level up but it's like that's the kind of church (laughs) really And of course, this is the most heretical thing you could say according to mainstream religion, but I really believe in that healing power and the necessity for that. Dude, do you think that that is what Arcadia is going to eventually turn into? (laughs) Because we have like a lot of priestesses already that have volunteered. (laughs) And I don't know, like maybe this is like just a step, (laughs) an evolutionary step towards that end. A lot of space here, structures. 
<laughs> oh man, I'm not doing any help for all of those haters on the internet who keep trying to tell me I'm starting a sex cult. <laughs> I'm just giving them all the ammunition they need. They're like, oh great, listen to what they said on this podcast. But I, I do though, I do fundamentally believe in that the healing of Eros. Yeah. The healing of and, it. And do you want to know something like women, we want, we like women want to give this medicine. You know, it's amazing to be able to uh, ah, see his potential or her potential and to be the, I don't know, vehicle by which another gets to experience their sacred or their holy or that eternal part of themselves like we, we want we want to we want to give that give right yeah yeah so what is your what are your thoughts like as we're we know we're clearly moving into a new story the old story of relationship hasn't served people if you just look in the mm -hmm. aggregate you can read you're probably friends with her dr wednesday martin imagine you guys live in the yeah. same city you know each yeah. other mm -hmm. her book untrue was great she shows in the aggregate all the graphs about erotic desire just kind of falling off a cliff in traditional mm -hmm. monogamous relationships, mm -hmm. both for men, which is a gradual decline. For women, it lasts for about two and a half years, and then it literally falls off a cliff. This is just in the aggregate speaking. We're not talking about yeah. the you know initiated priests and priestesses of the world, mm -hmm. but... And then the divorce rates are, you know, I think above 50%. Same with infidelity rates. And people are living in these shame-filled secret lives or quiet desperations. And so we understand that whole context. But then if you even go a step before that into the dating context, there's so much around, like, the idea of having sex for the sake of sex or for the sake of healing, healing, sexing, or just you know, the, the Hebrew word is lishma, lishma for its own sake, just sex for its own sake. It's, it's sometimes there's a culture that accepts that, but sometimes people are afraid because like, what is this going to mean? Does this mean we're in a relationship? Does this mean that there's going to be all of the attachments, all of those elements of love, quote, love that we talked about at the first part of the podcast that will come? And I recognize that there is, when you form that deep connection, there are things that attach you. There is an energetic exchange. There is a link. There is a sehelu, to say the avatar word, where you're merging with another being. But at the same time, it also feels like, yes, and like I think bringing back this idea of like, no, it's okay to just have an erotic experience, set the container for it with somebody in this conscious way. Say, we're going into this lishma for its own sake for the sake of this thing itself, and we may, may never talk to each other, we may never see no expectations, nothing like that. But it feels like that would also be like a helpful story to share rather than this, oh, oh that counts against your numbers. Who fucking cares? What the mm -hmm. fuck are you talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, like, is this going to bring more into your life? Is this going to make your life better? Is this experience going to increase not only the infinity of ecstasy of those moments that you shared, mm -hmm. but also bring an aftertaste that makes your life better. Mm -hmm. And it just feels like that's a, that's a better story to help people navigate even as they're reaching into, you know, a sacred union relationship and then using different technologies to keep that Eros alive, alive, alive throughout mm -hmm. their partnership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, um, yeah, I, 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 you, you, come on. I always have, <laughs> um, you know, the, 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 let's say there's the story before the story, you know, it's like Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, the whole thing. Like there's like the chapters, the chapter, let's say with which I have spent the majority of my life with my attention. It's like the most women, like women are the people that I have worked with for the past 30 years. The, uh, and most women come from such an extraordinary deficit in terms of uh, erotic aliveness or erotic fulfillment. You know, we live 
in a world where it's like, uh, you know, one out of every four women has been raped or violated. There's, uh, you know, it's, it's like 0.4 rapists will spend even a night in jail. There's a, a, a culture of abuse, uh, physical abuse, uh, verbal abuse, violence, sexual abuse, that uh, hashtag me too was, you know, five or 10 years ago where women finally were admitting that there were experiences of violation of their actual bodies that they were too ashamed to share. So we're, we're dealing with women who are uh, n- not filled up to the level of even understanding their own pleasure, their own connection to their own, the she who bleeds but does not die and gives life. They do, we do not know the holy in ourselves. That was certainly my story. That's why I started the School of Women in the Arts because I was so disenfranchised and uh, dejected and I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where my power was. And thank God I literally tripped over, uh, orgasm one day, <laughs> it's just lying there on the ground. I went, um, <laughs> but I <laughs> encountered a school which I, I subsequently studied at and learned all about my own orgasm and my own pleasure. But what I have found is until a woman can connect to that sense of her own aliveness, her own beauty, you know, we, you know, because this is how weird it is for women. Like, okay, what did your pussy get called or your parts get called when you were a little girl? Bean, vagina, yoni, there's, or what was yours? Uh, Wow. Okay. So, uh, and then how many of you had nothing where there was no name? And then if we had a room full of guys and I said, what'd your parts get called? The the guys would be like, penis, what's your problem, Regina? Like dick, that's that's my my dick, what? You know, so we don't even have a word for that which is essentially sacred, feminine about ourselves. And as soon as you take that word away, shame moves in. And then she becomes ashamed of every aspect of her body. She becomes ashamed of being a woman. She becomes filled with self-doubt, self-hatred, self-deprecation. And then this creature, which I certainly was, can't see a king. Even if she tripped over one, what she sees is somebody that she's scared of, somebody that could violate her. And so that's why I kind of started with women because I knew if I could turn women the fuck on, the first thing a woman would do would be like, turn, be like that. Oh, hello, stranger. I'm ready for you now. But we as women, we don't even put the key in our own ignition and turn that baby on and, and, and t- take her down the highway. And it's only when you do that that you can invite passengers. So it's like a huge missing inside the culture of feeding or fueling the holy in the feminine so she can recognize, oh, shit. I, I, I've always kind of been a high priestess. I just never knew. But here I am. <laughs> mm. Okay, world, I'm ready. But that's a process. Yeah. I got you. It seems that in in mate selection, discretion, you know, that kind of the ability to choose a partner too. Right. How invaluable oh my God. being tapped into oh my God. that would be to even oh. have the awareness oh to see goodness. like, oh yeah, this is a good choice so or this isn't a good choice. No, and don't you have girlfriends, like women that you know, that they're just always picking guys that are just going to fuck them up? Yeah. Anyone here ever do that? Yeah. Like just because we, you know, because like you, you, you know, you have to adore yourself to receive adoration and it doesn't happen without it. And so. And, and our mothers would have taught us if they only knew, but they didn't know. Um, and their mothers would have taught them and so on. So then here's the crazy part. And you know this, again, you're taking this responsibility very seriously. It's like, we are the generation of transformation. Like you think you're here just to make your life wonderful. Sorry. You're here because the ancestors could not grieve your tears, their tears. 
And so you are here to grieve them. You are here because your ancestors could not find the holy inside of their own bodies and live it in their lifetime. So that becomes your responsibility. You are here for the children of today who will be the men and women of tomorrow so you can fully embody your erotic aliveness, your erotic sovereignty, so that you can hold the high priestess and the queen in you so that you can elevate everyone because this shit ain't going to happen without the women on board. And so, like, it's, I think it's why things feel so fucking heavy right now because it's like we're not just crying our own tears. I feel like we're doing it forwards and backwards in time uh, because uh, we are alive mm. and we are able to hold it to the extent that we can. And being together, my brother, being your sister, allows me to hold it even deeper and wider than I could without you. And I hope vice versa. That is my wish. Yeah, sis. Yeah. Yeah, we make space for each other. Hmm. You know, it's it's hard to look back at the way that the world has distorted such an essential oh, foundation. It's so hard to look back at it. And there's so many ways you can look at it. And of course, you know, again, we've pointed, we've pointed out, you know, the religious aspects of it. There's many other cultural aspects of it. But there's this, I was, you know, doing some research and I didn't know where I was going to go with my, you know, wild Arcadia speech, but it led me down a bunch of rabbit holes. And one of the rabbit holes was into, you know, alternative health and medicine. And it led me to the story of John Harvey Kellogg. Do you know the story of John Harvey Kellogg? No, but could you do it in an accent? <laughs> I probably could, but it'd probably be the same as the only accent I could. I got two accents. I got Borat. <laughs> And I got somebody from the South. <laughs> so maybe if one of them okay. comes out, I'll tell you, darling. <laughs> you be careful. Huck Huckleberry Red <laughs> might show up. And a Huckleberry Red shows up. There's only two things that gets going to happen. You're either going to get wet or you're going to get wet. <laughs> <laughs> So the story of John Harvey Kellogg. So how many of you have had Kellogg cereal? Yeah. Kellogg cereal, every fucking grocery store. They make all kinds of the fucking cereal. Well, the reason that cornflakes were developed is because John Harvey Kellogg, and you got to imagine now a man that always dressed in a white on white suit with white leather shoes and a white hat with a white fucking cockatoo on his shoulder a live bird that's cool but what he was doing was not cool because he called masturbation the vile inclination and he was at war with eros so he developed cornflakes to drop people's sexual appetite and desire what is the most bland fucking thing we can make for people so it'll sap their eros and then he put ads out in newspapers this gets fucking worse this gets dark he put ads out in newspapers and it looks like a fucking summer summer cramp it's called battle creek sanitarium and it's kids playing and you'll get all healthy and blah 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 and he would lure particularly the these young men into his battle creek sanitarium Sanitarium. And if he saw or suspected they had an inclination to masturbate, he would bind their hands so they wouldn't touch themselves or put cages, cages around their cocks. But every day, even if you had a cage around their cock, he would take a 15 quart enema and give all yeah. the boys enemas with his white fucking cockatoo on his shoulder. And that's not even the worst of it. What he recommended to women was that they put carbolic acid Ooh. on their clitoris to numb all sensation or even recommended clitorectomies to remove the clitoris entirely to keep them from pleasuring themselves. And if a man, even if the cage didn't work and even if the tied hands doesn't work, 
he would say, let's circumcise them without anesthesia so that it will associate pain with their cock to such a degree that they won't want to masturbate. And that motherfucker has cereal boxes in every fucking grocery store. I feel so queasy right now. I know. It's nauseating, right? It's really rough. Like this, this, these ideas, we don't even know how they've been woven into the fabric of our fucking culture. You know, like it's a dark story of a very dapper and interesting fucking person, but fuck. I mean, is it worse than the Catholic priests? Probably not really, but it's, yeah, there's like a lot of bad shit out there, baby. And, and, and again, that's this why is, we need this, this temple that exactly, you're building here. Is, these are the failures of Eros. Like, if he was allowed to just be the flamboyant gay man that he was and just yeah. get fucked, mm-hmm. you know, just just fucking bite down and grab the sheets and just let someone yeah. give it to him, yeah. Battle Creek Sanitarium would have been dope. Yeah, People would have been eating sure. fucking bacon and eggs. For sure. You know? That's for sure. But it, it was the failure of his ability. And then he just played that out all over the world. Yeah. Well, isn't it? It's like so interesting, right? The thing that is the most healing is the, you know, because you and I know that literally, like, if we did take the high priestesses to the Middle East, things would improve. That if you actually did create that temple that you're in, that's in your dreams or imagination, or in my dreams and my imagination, right? It would be such service. But that, uh, with, there's so much uh, negativity inside the wider culture that someone like that Kellogg dude could get away with that shit. But could we stand in our truth long enough to actually build a healing center that was uh, around erotic transformation or um reclamation you know could we stand the shit storm that would inevitably come if we chose to create such a healing center and i mean people got away with like if if you think about it you know in my lifetime no yoga wasn't really practiced widely or meditation you know 50 years ago like maybe Maybe this could this dream could actually be fulfilled. It, with the uh, with the right sacred audacity, you know, another yeah. word, tekufat, sacred audacity. I like those two of words course, together. Of course, it yeah. could be done, and we're in fucking Nevada. You know, they got the fucking bunny ranch here, so you can go pay money to have sex. So this model is already legal in the very state that we stand in, but. The bunny ranch is not a place where there's a lot of healing happening. I mean, that's a place where you'll, you know, find someone like OD'd on a lot of drugs and cocaine and Viagra and in the fucking dark pit of despair. I mean, I don't know. I've never been there. I don't Maybe there's some lovely people having fantastic experiences. Could be. Yeah. No, I didn't mean to cast shade unnecessarily on the bunny ranch, which I don't know shit about. Mm -hmm. So blessings to bunny ranchers who are all around. But like fundamentally if that can exist right. and also the decriminalization of psychedelic medicine that's happening mm-hmm. you know yeah. around the place so if it was a place where there was cannabis infused wine and then you pay for a whole entire different experience yeah it's it's fucking legal like somebody could do it mm-hmm. like it could be done yeah, it would not even in secrecy and of course you could make it a church and do go that route and you know, fight the all the way to the Supreme Court for that. But it just requires the sacred audacity Mm -hmm. to be able to take all the shit, all the hell, to be able to stand at the tip, you know, and just look out at the storm that's coming and just say, yeah, all right, do your worst. Like Mm -hmm. I'm standing for something I believe in. Mm -hmm. I'm standing for something that I know will change and reclaim something important for the world. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, thinking about it, like it's, I mean, I started with women, but I started with a handful of women in my living room. And then that shit just grew and grew until I was doing thousands and thousands of women 
And I'm not saying we didn't get thrown out of our fair share of venues, but I'm still standing, still here before you. (laughs) The pussy liberator. (laughs) The the legend lives. (laughs) And that's, you know, that's also something to be said for your character, like your willingness to stand for that. How much... Because I think there's a perceived amount of shit that you're going to get, a perceived amount of arrows that you're going to get for standing in that way. But you've done with such brazen confidence, such sacred audacity, (laughs) you know, such sacred audacity. Mm -hmm. My bet would be that it's actually less than people would think that you get, or maybe not. I don't know. What's your experience? How much have you been attacked for the work and what, for what you're standing for in the world? Uh, It would come and go. I think that probably the person that uh, was most deeply affected was probably my daughter, you know, because for example, when I used to teach, we, uh, I had a brownstone on West 88th street where I raised her and raised the school. And um, my neighbors thought that we were running a whorehouse because we put rose petals on the stoop and women would come in the evening for class. Then they would leave. And so there was like a misperception of what was happening at my house that sometimes little girls were not allowed to come over and play with her because I had a stripper pole in my bedroom that I used for upper body fitness. Uh, You know, Sheila Kelly S factor, right? But, you know, but people didn't understand what that was. Um, You know, getting... She was nearly rejected from the, she was, uh, I applied to, she has dyslexia. So like that school, when they saw what I did, it was difficult to have, get her accepted. So I think she had a hard time. Uh, and then also I, I literally did get thrown out of every venue in New York City. Literally, I've been thrown out of uh, every every hall that I rented because as soon as you have women feeling hot or beautiful. And then they run to the bathroom in lingerie because they're in class feeling pretty. And then, then I get, you know, oh, please, you can't ever come back here again. Or I, I've got cleaning bills from venues, uh, Tribeca Film Festival for pussy juice on the walls. Like we weren't, we weren't putting pussy juice on the walls, just sitting there sometimes in lingerie. But you know, like people think crazy shit is coming down. So, uh, but uh, overall, I think I pulled that shit off really fly. Like, yeah. I handled it. Like, man, we there was always a place. Like, we'd get thrown out, but we'd always find a place. Kind of like you guys this weekend. Yeah. The, the thing was going to get shut down, but you just don't agree with it. And then a miracle happens. So, uh, and I think that's the gift of uh, the razor's edge. Is that's where all the miracles live, is on that razor's edge. What you're expressing is the structures and systems actually working against you in different ways. You know, yeah. the structures were p- trying to prevent you from offering your gift, and the, and it was too too transgressive to their own mores or their mm-hmm. own you know corporate ideas of how to play within the system, and you know received on all that. But what about the people that just come at you i mean you have social media you yeah. know what about like the people that come at you are there people who are like i can't believe you're doing this I, like do you get really attacked online okay, for what is, you do this is a crazy thing right because i was so scared to write a book that said pussy on the cover because my last book is called pussy a reclamation new york times bestseller hello um and i was terrified i thought i was going to be killed for doing that and dude just slid right on down and actually the week that the book came out trump was saying on extra or whatever the tv show uh, I, I just grabbed him by the pussy and so then they interviewed me at the washington observer the most conservative newspaper in the world who you just wrote a book called pussy and there donald trump just said that thing about pussy so like let's interview so it actually was weird like okay he, I'm probably the only woman that he advantaged 
<laughs> and really, it might be the only. You know, I can't think of one else. But but it's we it's uh it's it's weird. Like moving into those spaces of greatest vulnerability, uh, there is always grace. And uh, yeah, I mean, people would attack me, but uh, not like, I don't know. I just didn't choose to notice it very much. Yeah. I think that's such a powerful message for the audience, you know, not just this audience in front of us, but the audience listening online or watching this on, on, you know, TV. There's a perception of how much you're going to get attacked. Mm -hmm. And there are certain times where you can't say anything because whatever you say, you're going to get attacked. We're in one of those times right now. There's nothing you can say that won't get you attacked by somebody. And there's times like that, that it's actually true. But Really, when you stand for something that's in your deepest core competency, not only does it make you feel alive, like you're suffocating and now you can breathe again because you're expressing your truth, it's rare that when you're in the full radical expression of an embodied truth, something that you know and something that you're willing to stand for, all of that kind of disappears mm -hmm. because you plant yourself on a hill and say, yeah, this is my hill and I'm willing to die on this fucking hill. And I think that's an important thing for me that I always think about is like, I don't want to get caught in some ravine or valley or someplace where I don't have an embodied knowledge or wisdom and something I really want to stand for and get attacked a bunch for. It's like, I don't even really know. I just found myself in this valley and I'm caught in this crossfire and I don't want to be in this fucking fight. But there's other places where it's like, no, 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 this hill, here I am. Mm -hmm. And I'll be here like Alexander the Great with a double-plumed helmet on. And anybody who wants to shoot their arrows, shoot them at me first. And those places, like the whole orientation towards that culture of attack, the culture of trying to tear down, it changes. Not only is there less that actually comes when you make that strong stance, because they can feel that you're coming from a place and they mm -hmm. can feel that you're not going to back down. And it's this kind of like interesting primal dance, you know, as, as a man, I've been in a lot of places where there was a sense of potential imminent hostility or violence, you know, from just the place that I was, whether it was a nightclub or a street mm. where the bars mm. were coming out or whatever. And there's been a lot of, you know, close encounters to actual physical confrontations and except for one time, and I've told the story too many times, but except for one time, my willingness to say like, no, like I'm here, I don't want a fight, but if it turns into a fight, you better pack a lunch, motherfucker, because <laughs> I'm not going to run. Like you're going to be, you're going to be in this. And the other people would, would see that and they'd be like, yeah, all right. You know, I'm not ready for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. so there's a, a different way when you really know and you're standing for something mm -hmm. that you know is true and mm -hmm. that you're not going to back down. Yeah. The whole world responds differently. W were you always that way, like when you were a little boy? Wow. Yeah, I wow. was. I remember there was a there was an older kid, and uh, this older kid kept putting like tight rubber bands on his dog it was like a collie oh my god oh and my i was god. like Whoa. I, and i was like i had this deep love like i've always loved the goddess in all her forms including animals and people and you know i was smaller than this kid but i was you know i had blessed by my family i was trained in some martial arts and that kind of confidence in that bushido spirit and to just know what is good so I remember like, I was like, you can't fucking do that, man. Do you understand what that your dog's trying to get it off? It's cutting off the blood flow in his leg. He can't walk right. Like mm -hmm. you don't fucking do that, man. You want to know how that feels? And I tackled that dude to the ground and I just held his arm in this wow. high position. He's like, this is what it feels. You want to walk around all day like this? Cause I'll be here all fucking day and I'll do this all day. You take those fucking rubber bands off your dog. You don't do that. Uh you know, so there was some part of me that was always like, and I was a chill kid. I was yeah. playful, chill. But there's always a moment where I was like, uh-uh, like mm -hmm. that's not right. 
you know, this is not how this is going to go down. So I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe my mother was a, my grandmother was a fighter. You know, she stood up to the oil companies in mm -hmm. Southern California and would protest. And she was even shot at at one point because she was fighting like big oil. Mm -hmm. And there was like a drive-by. They tried, like she was going to court to testify. She won the court case. So my grandma, who's on my, on my <gasps> arm. Yes, yeah, my grandma right here. The wow. grandma Bonnie. So there was something that came through my mother's line. Yeah. That was like transmitted to me this mm -hmm. love and desire to protect all life. Yeah. And to be willing to put yourself on the line. And then something that came from my father's line, which was like he would always, to his very best, do what was good. You know, like if he forgot, we could be flying from New York to LA and he could remember that he forgot to tip the bellman who brought the luggage to the car. And he would, you know, he was, he had, you know, assistance and people, but if he didn't, he would call him himself and he'd like, look, the bellman looked like this. This is what he looked like. I forgot to, I forgot to give him a tip. I'm going to, back then you couldn't wire money or Zella money or cash app. So you had to fucking send money. So you would courier some money over there and you're like, make sure this money goes to that person. Like there was a goodness in him where he had mm -hmm. to do what was right, no matter what. And so that combination, and then my stepdad, you know, he was a SWAT team officer in Compton. So he dealt with some crazy wild shit, but it wasn't just that he wanted to be a hero for the people to actually protect and serve. He was that way, the same way, like when, you know, we had different pets and a pet would escape. And remember when we first got chinchillas, I told you this whole chinchilla story, but before this whole chinchilla story got crazy, uh, if you guys really want to hear a chinchilla story, I'll tell it. But the, the importance of this story is one of them got into one of the like downstairs, like uh, air conditioning attic ducts that was just full of rat poop and just disgusting place. And it was stuck down there. And my stepdad's a big guy. And we were like, oh, the chinchilla is stuck in the thing, you know? And he was like, all right, God damn it. And he just got down there and slid through all of the rat shit and all of the dust and belly crawled his way until he could find that chinchilla and bring it back up so that me and my sisters could, you know, rescue the rat. So he has the, he had this like hero impulse. So Okay. All right. So here you got the heroine on your arm. Yeah. The heroine of your mama, the hero, hero of your dad and your stepdad. Do you feel like you have stepped fully into the mission of all of that lineage? Like, is there a still yet next step of you standing for the world in a way that you have not yet stood? Are you at the place that was, you know, like, you know what I mean? Where, where do I meet you in your story? Mm. Well, I think it's a, it's a, Const that's a beautiful question thank you for the question it's a constant evolution mm -hmm. and the ev it's a desk it's a journey not a destination but i know that i'm farther along in that journey than i've ever been mm -hmm. and i'm more comfortable you know i shared in my speech last night you know the lakota saying which is i am ready for whatever comes next i am always ready for whatever comes next and as the intensity of the world has increased, I've made deeper and deeper peace with, all right, you know, if, if it's death, it's death. If it's canceling on social media, it's canceling on social media. If yeah. they freeze my bank accounts, they freeze my bank accounts. Like, like I'm ready, you know, like I'm ready to stand. And, and I don't know if there's another level of that because I still cry when I watch movies of heroes that do things that remind me of an element of who I really am. Mm -hmm. And the reason I cry is because I know there's a little bit more that I could give. There's a little bit, there's a way that I could be willing to sacrifice more comfort to stand more deeply in the fullness of who I am for the mm -hmm. world. So I know there's still more, more to go, but I'm at the place of the most it's ever been. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting because like I'm writing a new book and talking about the difference between the hero's journey and the courtesan's journey. And one of the um, differentials 
you know, which you've picked up from this indigenous thread of allowing yourself to be open, to be broken and remade by life, which is not a typical hero move, right? A typical hero move is, I will slay that dragon. I will bring back the dragon's head. I will triumph, right? You're willing to, uh, to allow yourself to kind of surrender into what life wants of you and for you. And I would say that's your pussy. <laughs> Dragon pussy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is such a, also a key thing. I mean, there's a, there's the plastic coated shell, this shallow, brittle shell of masculinity, which says, I will not break. I will not cry. I yeah. will not, I right. will not be fucked open by the world. I will not be fucked into into tears and blabbering sweat yeah. and purges and but that's not a solid strong hero a solid strong actual hero in the hero's journey will allow that to happen allow all of the armor to melt mm -hmm. into nothing so all you are is the vulnerable tender flesh of the soft animal right and then from there, you can build back your mm -hmm. scales and find the dragon breath that comes from the mm -hmm. center of your heart and mm -hmm. not slay the dragon, but become the dragon. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. that's the real story of the hero. Become the dragon, mm -hmm. become you know, like inextricably linked mm -hmm. to your power and mm -hmm. your power in that comes from your goodness. It has to come from your heart, not the power of your talons or the burning of the breath. It's the breath of the heart of life itself that mm -hmm. you can breathe through you. And then when the scales get too bulky and they get barnacles and the things aren't working right and the horns have grown so high that it's dragging your head down, allow yourself to burn back down into the mm -hmm. soft animal that you are, unscaled, unhorned, unarmored. Mm -hmm. And then trust that you'll be able to build back into an even more beautiful dragon. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing right now, Tina Turner. You know where I'm going with this? We don't need another hero. Come on, come on, just sing along now. We don't need to know the way home. I don't know, I'm not really good at covering it, but you know what I mean? It's just like, the, it's, it's that moment of... Uh, Surrendering that almost like the new hero is not the hero. It's the one that gets broken and remade by life and is in relationship with the, that which is greater at all times. Mm. You know what's so funny about us? We've gone from like heavy as fuck and spiritual <laughs> to like the whores and the, uh, and the high priestesses and the humor and the nasty and it's fun to bounce with you. <laughs> yeah, this is, you know, this is also a re-categorization and a re-understanding of what spiritual is. You know, like spiritual, people think it has to be on a mountaintop somewhere, or be in a church, or be in this pure, we've equated spirituality with this, you know, concept of purity of just outside of the body. But the most powerful spirituality is that fully embodied, alive in every cell spirit that moves in you, as you, and through you spirituality that includes when we're all dancing later tonight to Troy Boy and we're just fucking in it. Like then that's a, it's a re-understanding of what spirituality really is as we've tried to separate, you know, good which is above bad which is below you know even the symbol of the devil is like a goat or a horned animal well the goat was what gave blood and milk and meat and fed the people and this was a revered animal in the pagan traditions and then they're like nope this represents carnality the horny goat the the the, the animality so animality bad spirit good and that all that whole story needs to be collapsed so we can step into a greater wholeness. Truth. So you're saying that the antidote is, is or well, the antidote to all this fucked up spirituality is for us to all party like animals tonight. <laughs> that's how I'm. That's what I'm drawing from this podcast. Is that about where you're at? 
Okay, fine. Good. <laughs> we want to make it digestible so that we know the yeah. actions to take. Oh, and, no. And it's Party Like Animals on Sacred Medicine. <laughs> I believe that is my conclusion. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> it's, and it's not to disclaim that it's not powerful to go to a Vipassana retreat and do all, I do all those things too. It's not You've like, been to a Vipassana retreat? I did the darkness retreat, which is silence. You get, you get like extra points for the darkness? Uh, well, I feel that way, but okay, I don't God. know if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but fundamentally, it's similar. Silence. Yeah, no, it's true. Darkness. Nobody to talk to. Mm-hmm. Nobody to See, hear you. See, I would you. never you do that. I would go down. like on a fuck retreat. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to go sit in darkness and go uh, like sit on a meditation cushion for 10 days. I could be, I could have like orgasmic meditation for 10 days. You could just like hang out in bed with my boyfriend. <laughs> no, <I'm> kidding. <laughs> there's so many forms of, there's so many forms of beautiful no, medicine, right. you know, right. it's you're like, right. and, and, and people try to create a hierarchy too. Yeah. You know, even people with the psychedelic movement, they're like, there's some way in which like, oh, well, I can get there through meditation. So you may get, you need three grams of mushrooms or a cup of ayahuasca, but I can just sit on my chair. And some part of me is like, well, does that make you a better person? Like, congratulations, if you can. First of all, like, I'm not exactly sure. Have you drank a couple cups of ayahuasca? Are you sure it's the same thing? So I have some questions. And if they can, which I believe some people can, like, great, but does that make you fundamentally better? You know, and that's, there's also these value hierarchies that Mm -hmm. people place where the the spiritual materialism, oh, well, I'm better because I can do it this way. Mm -hmm. doesn't make you better. It's just a different path. Mm -hmm. And each path has its own advantages Mm -hmm. and disadvantages and its own effort that you have to apply. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful to have cultivated Mm -hmm. a 40-year meditation practice where you can explore all the Mm -hmm. lokas of the great Mm -hmm. cosmos Mm -hmm. with just your mind. Yeah. And doesn't make you better. Like, we got to stop this, I'm better than you because I believe this, or I'm better than you because I do this. No, you're not better than anyone. Nobody's better than anyone. Well, but what was it? I don't know why my mind went here, but like, I'm just like curious. What was it? This is random about Vailana that you were like, oh shit, that one. I will have that woman. She will be mine. (laughs) And I should say, I agree with your choice. Totally. Like, you know, she, she and I just spent the last five days together with Peter. We had so much fun. And she did this crazy ass, like fucking mind blowing, gorgeous, ecstatic, orgasmic sound healing uh, with us. And it was so beautiful. But I'm wondering, like, what was it about the medicine of Vi where you were just like, oh, shit, hmm. that is my queen. Hmm. And when was the moment? <laughs> well, we met at Bernie. We met at Okay, so and Vi was very, very closed off to my energy. Very closed off. Now I was in a now, polyamorous. Say, okay, okay. I was just, in a okay. like just you know, as an aside and you know, working for my girls here. So you don't necessarily have to be open. Like because it's a vibe, right? And he could feel her underneath her closeness. And he was like, uh-huh, right? Yeah, there was because some- you wanted to crack that nut, didn't you? <laughs> More than anything. <laughs> but I could see underneath it, there was this vibrancy of being. Like when, when she would dance, it was like, you know, how, you, know, you know how Frodo in Lord of the Rings, when the <laughs> eye of Sauron was up in the sky and he was just like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> ah, I can't stop looking at the eye of Sauron. It was like reversed, like like her booty moving around and her strings out there on the playa. I was like, oh my God, I can't stop looking. I would have to like move my face manually, like look, <laughs> look another direction, act cool, look another direction. <laughs> there is something absolutely irresistible in my attraction. So it first yeah. started with attraction. And the attraction led me to, and I could also see that there was a sense, something deeper. So I invited her to her first sacred plant medicine journey. And I remember, you know, she loves telling this story, but it was the same for me. We sat 
across from me, or we stood across from each other on the center table of Don Howard's Mesa. And we, pl- we tapped into the table, which is putting two fingers on the table. And we were just looking across from each other uh-huh. after drinking Wachuma that day before. And I just looked in and I was like, wow, this is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my whole life. But I'm not looking at her beauty that on the outside, which initially allured me, I'm seeing a beauty that goes so deep that there is no end. It's like the infinite, the infinite void of beauty that I could see all the Mm. way through to the Mm. first spark of creation Mm. from that moment of energy of the Big Bang coming right through her whole essence. And I was like, fuck, I'm fucked. (laughs) Like, I'm fucked. And, you know, of course, then the first time we made love, magical, mystical things occurred. It was actually not even a private encounter making love it was a threesome but in that mm-hmm. threesome like even in the chance where i got to merge zivuk sacred like the union of our bodies afterwards i had an open-eyed visual of this star that was in my third eye it was just like the craziest i've never had a vision like that i could open my eyes close my eyes move all around do whatever i wasn't on a bunch of medicine and this star like a bright star and it was It literally felt like God was like, uh, let's just put an asterisk on this (laughs) and never let you rest or sleep a single day (laughs) until you find out what this star being is Mm -hmm. all about. Yeah. And uh, that's initial desire and love and allurement to her has only just increased as her power is going as she's worked with you to really reclaim her own eros and sexuality in her own body she just becomes more and more intoxicatingly irresistible to me with every passing moment of every day yeah that's gorgeous i love that and are you guys gonna have babies I don't know how you started interviewing me on this podcast here. I don't know. I'm curious. I'm just curious because like I I just think it would be a really nice thing. Yeah. Yeah. We gotta we have we're gonna have babies. We got a name. Name's uh gonna be Huxley. And we're gonna call him Hux, Huxley Marcus. And uh at least that's the I idea love that now. name. Yeah, as well as you know, Aldous Huxley is one of my favorite authors, a book that changed my life was Aldous Huxley's book, Island. And I really thought he understood something about the evolution of what culture could be. He was a unbelievable psychonaut who lived and actually literally died on the path of the medicine, looking for the moksha, that perfect medicine and the quest for the Holy grail and understanding, you know, the human spirit. And, uh, he just didn't know it was pussy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe he did. I could have helped him with that. You could have helped him with that. (laughs) And speaking with with help, like, how would you just, let's get no tactical for just a moment here, you know, as we're moving to close. How would you get tactical? We've talked about high level, about how important this is and how, like, where should a woman start? You know, if they're listening to this and like, man, that seems so far away from where I'm at. Like, where where does a woman start? I think the the first the most important step, like the first thing is just every woman should get a copy of Pussy or Reclamation. And it's not a joke. Like it's beautiful opening into a woman's reclamation of her sacred erotic aliveness or listen to the audio if you don't like to read. But, you know, this is not a journey that a woman can do. We can't do it by ourselves. You know, you cannot just sit there like, like you can with meditation. It's re- sisterhood is required. You know, it used to be back in the days that when our mamas knew shit, they would, this would be a mother to daughter uh, education where, uh, you know, uh, and, but most, most of our mothers have lost the thread based on growing up and living in a patriarchal world culture. So it's about sisterhood. It's about connection. It's about a woman finding a way to say yes her deepest fears, her deepest longings, and her deepest desires. And sisterhood and community is the way. So I think starting with the book is like step one. 
Mm. It's, re- it's yeah. really like nicely laid out. So even if you're scared, you could do okay with it. Yeah. And, you know, women of all ages are a little scared, right? Like, is it is it fear of, because I think we're all afraid, not of our weakness, but of our power. Right on. You know? Yeah. Well, I, I think that it's, um, it's sort of a, it's, it's asking a woman, you know, we, we've all ha- have these like chains of the patriarchy around us that we think are going to protect us. Like if we play small, we'll be okay in this life. And then you discover that playing small leads to depression, disenfranchisement, disapproval, self-hatred. But it doesn't seem like there's any way out of that. And to boldly go where no woman has gone before and say yes to pleasure, yes to her sex and sexuality, yes to pussy, uh, is like the ultimate heroine's journey. You, you just need ovaries of steel to go <laughs> against the culture and say, fuck, I am going to own my beauty. I'm going to own my pussy because a woman who owns her pussy owns her life. And you don't own your pussy, you do not own your life. And I don't care how many degrees you have or, you know, what C-suite office you work in, you do not own your pussy, you are owned by the patriarchy. So it's, it's kind of like the time, you know, I think that women are the greatest untapped natural resource on this planet. And the time is now. Let's go. Take your power back. <laughs> thank you, Mama Gina. And thank you, Aww, Regina. Thank, thank you, sis, baby. for everything that you've done for this world. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.